Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for EMCA's Hellenic, Philhellenic Women and Their Effect on the Hellenic Revolution panel discussion. Our panel discussion today is in commemoration of the anniversary of what has been called the Dance of Zalango, the mass suicide of the women of Sully and their children during the Suliot War on December 16, 1803 against Ali Pasha of Yanina. My name is Lou Katzos, uh, president and founder of EMCA, and among other things, the chairman of a Hepis Hellenic Cultural Commission. The panel for this unique event will be moderated by EMCA's executive vice president, Marina Belesis Casoria. Our distinguished panel includes Congresswoman Caroline Maloney, the co-chair of the Congressional Hellenic Caucus, Professor Emeritus Eleni Angelomatis Tsugarakis of the Department of History at Ionian University, History Professor Maureen Santelli of North Virginia Community College, and Maria Kaliambu, Senior Lecturer at the Hellenic Studies Program at Yale University. University. The focus of the panel discussion will be on the brave and heroic Hellenic women of the revolution, which included among others well-known women, such as Lascarina Bubulina, Manto Mavroyenu, Ralu, Karatsa, and lesser known ones, such as Stavriana Savena and Constantina Zacharia, but also um, a common heroines of the revolution that are not necessarily discussed in these type of discussions. They're going to talk about the Mesolongisas, the Maniatisas, uh, and the Maniatisas, some of them were uh, known as the, uh, as the Amazons of Biru, for example, uh, because they did fight within the revolution, as well as precursors to the revolution, such as Mo Mosco Tzavela and the Sudotisas. The discussion will, will also include historic Hellenic folktales around warrior women. In addition, but not finally, the discussion will incorporate the history of the Philhellenic women of the various committees in America that supported the revolution during the period and later cross-generationally uh, became active and seriously affected the abolitionist and women's suffrage movements in the United States. As an example of those cross-generational women of the revolution uh, or, or affected by the revolution was Julia Ward Howe, who was an advocate for abolition along with her husband, Samuel Gridley Howe, who fought in the Hellenic Revolution. Julia was uh, a socially active individual, particularly for women's suffrage. She later wrote, among many other things, the Battle Hymn of the Republic and the 1870 Pacifist Mother's Day Proclamation. The Hellenic Revolution's effects on the American abolitionist movement and women's suffrage movement will be further elaborated in on two uh, future EMCA events, one in February during Black History Month and the other in March during Women's History Month. Also, the Orphans of the Revolution will be discussed today and we will have a special event on the Orphans of the Revolution who were brought into the United States. This event and others we have had and are being planned are part of EMCA's American Hellenic Revolution of 1821 Bicentennial Committee series of events focusing not only on the revolution, but also importantly on the American diaspora and international aspects and influences of the revolution for the upcoming 200th anniversary uh, in uh, 2021. Before we start the uh, panel discussion, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce internationally known crossover classical soprano singer, Anastasia Zanis, who has joined us from Athens. Welcome, Anastasia. Hello, good afternoon from Athens. An Thank Anastasia you. Anastasia studied classical song at the Athens Conservatory where she, learned her, where she earned her diploma with honors. She also specialized in jazz music at the London Royal Academy of Music. She sings fluently in English, Greek, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese. Anastasia has performed at world premier institutions and venues. 
both as a solo performer and in cooperation with world-renowned artists in major concerts around the world. She has delivered sold out uh, personal concerts at Carnegie Hall in New York, at the Athenaeum in Budapest, uh, the Palace Theater in Athens, Keriaki Hall in Tokyo, and many other venues. Her strong stage presence and vocal range uh, lends itself to unique, unique performances in ancient Hellenic theaters. And she has won various awards, including Best Performance Award in Seoul's World Trades Fair, Prize Performance Award in the Chesme Song Festival in Turkey, and the Olympic Committee Award for Contributions to the Hellenic Olympic Games in 2014. She will sing two songs for us before we start the panel discussion. The first one will be Isuliotis, in honor of those brave women who lost their lives in uh, December 16th and uh, what this event is in com commemoration of. And she will also sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic for this special occasion. The Battle Hymn of the Republic was, was written obviously after the revolution, but it links that cross-generational uh, cross, uh, aspect that I discussed earlier relating to the effects of the revolution on the American abolitionist movement. Anastasia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your kind words and for uh, all these details about my, my CV. I'm, uh, I'm deeply honored to be part of your panel discussion tonight and perform especially for you ladies. And this is uh, very inspiring. And I think uh, women in power still inspire uh, in our days and what, a, what better than that about the Greek women and the, the Greek revolution. I believe that the, the message is always uh, getting stronger with the, through the power of music. So I'm happy to perform for you the next uh, very sensitive song, Suliotises. For the lyrics in English for the people who don't understand for our friends, they say, the fish cannot live on the land nor the flower on the sand. And the woman of Suli cannot live without freedom. Farewell springs, valleys, mountains, and hills. Farewell to you, women of Suli. So Suliotis is the Greek traditional. Στις τεριάδες ζήτω ψάρι, στις τεριάδες ζήτω ψάρι, ούτε αν το στην αμμουδιά, ούτε αν το στην αμμουδιά. Έχετε για βρυσούλες, Κάμι μου να ραχούλε, έχετε για βρυσούλε. Κάμι μου να ραχούλε. Τι σου λέω, δεν ζούμε. Τι σου δεν ζούμε. Τίχο. Την ελευθεριά, δίχω στην ελευθεριά. Έχετε για βρυσούλε, κάμπι μου να ραχούλε. Έχετε για βρυσούλε, κάμπι μου να ραχούλε. Έχετε για βρυσούλε και εσύ σου λιωτοπούλε. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anastasia, you're going to be singing another song uh, shortly in terms of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. But for the audience, understand that, uh, that uh, this particular commemoration. Uh, has to do with, with the, final, the final battles of, uh, of Sully, 
in 1803. And for those who don't know, the Suryatas were very famous uh, uh, warriors and uh, were part of a warrior society that included them, the Manyates, and the, uh, the people from Himara, which is in uh, now Southern Albania. And some of the women that were there, one of the precursors I mentioned earlier, who was uh, Mosko Zavela. Uh, Mosko Zavela was uh, a very famous woman. She, in fact, partook in the, uh, the Battle of Kiafa when the Sudotas fought off the Ottomans. And she led 400 women uh, in the battle that uh, led to, uh, among other things, two to 3,000 Ottomans uh, losing their lives and only 74 Greeks losing their lives. So with that, uh, Anastasia will now sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, one of the most famous songs of the Civil War. As mm -hmm. we indicated, the, uh, the uh, Hellenic Revolution tremendously affected the abolitionist movement in the United States, as well as the women's suffrage movement, uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Okay. <laughs> Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trembling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible sweet sword. He is truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Marching on, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching. Um. <laughs> that, that was that was well, absolutely that was absolutely fantastic uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce emka's executive vice president and panel moderator marina balesis casoria who will start the panel discussion marina is the president of ideas unlimited and a creative development consultant at the intersection of, of strategy, programming, resource development, and communications for organizations. She is a certified fundraising executive with over 20 years of experience working with community-based organizations, philanthropy, corporate social responsibility, and strategic partnerships. Marina has served as a member of uh, the public affairs team at uh, Con Edison, managing corporate responsibility strategic partnerships, government relations, community relations, emergency management, and public affairs. She is a founding board member of El Pides, dedicated uh, to supporting victims of domestic violence, and her corporate service includes membership to various and many boards. She is the founder of Elios Project, whose mission is advocacy, mm -hmm. community relations, and development initiatives in response to humanitarian, and refugee crises in Greece, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Serbia, Turkey, via leadership, development, and community engagement. Marina. Thank you so much, Lou, and welcome everyone to this landmark event on Hellenic and Philhellenic women and their effect on the Hellenic Revolution. Welcome to all our esteemed panelists and honored guests. We are very happy today to have with us a distinguished panel for this topic, a topic concerning women and the revolution, the war of Greek independence. And we're very excited, especially today, to welcome Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, 
who is the founder and co-chair of the Hellenic Caucus in Congress. She is a recognized progressive leader on, with extensive uh, experiences and accomplishments in financial services, national security, the economy, and women's issues. She is the chairwoman of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, where she was reelected to continue again in the next Congress in the footsteps of her beloved friend, Congressman Elijah Cummings. May his memory be eternal. Congresswoman Maloney has graciously agreed to serve on EMCA's American Hellenic Revolution Bicentennial Celebration Committee. She is loved and appreciated and admired by her many friends and constituents in the Hellenic American community where she represents the largest global Hellenic diaspora outside of Greece and Cyprus. She is a friend of EMCA and she uh, watches over the East Mediterranean, the Balkans, and um, certainly with uh, all of the uh, challenges to democracy and freedom, she is an advocate for American values in rule of law and human rights. And I just wanna thank you, Congresswoman, because I know you have a very special presentation for us. Thank you for joining us and for being a champion of Hellenism and women's rights. Oh, thank you, Marina, for that really uh, beautiful introduction and to you and Lou for putting this together. It's a really very special event and it's a very special year given that it's also the 100th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote here in America. And of course the Hellenes and the Americans have a very special uh, connection historically and presently and into the future. So, so first I wanna thank you to the Eastern Mediterranean Business Cultural Alliance for organizing this great event and thank you to IMCA President Lukatsos and Executive Direct Director Vice President Marina Belesis Casoria. Uh, and I thank you for making this all happen. As a member of IMCA's American Hellenic Revolution Bicentennial Celebration Committee, I am truly excited uh, to honor the heroic Hellenic and American Philhellenic women of the Greek War of Independence whose consequential actions helped free Greece and her people from the yoke of the Ottoman Empire. As we approach the 200th anniversary of the Greek War of Independence, it's incumbent upon all of us to honor the legacy of these women and recognize how their actions influenced the relationship between the US and Greece. I have the unique privilege of representing one of the largest Greek American communities in the US and Astoria, Queens, and I am blessed to call many of them my very close friends. My constituents inspired me to co-found and co-chair the Congressional Caucus on Hellenic Issues in 1996 with former Congressman Mike Belagrakis. His son, Gus, took over as co-chair after his father retired in 2007. With more than 110 members, from both uh, parties, it's bipartisan. It is one of the most active uh, and bi bipartisan caucuses in the House of Representatives. And I'm especially honored that my friends in the Hellenic community have bestowed me with the nickname Bubalina after Alaskrina Bubalina, one of the many great warriors of the Greek War of Independence and whose home I had the privilege of visiting in 2016. I don't deserve this honor, but I am truly uh, a thrill to, to carry Bubalina's name as a nickname. She was a trailblazer in her own right and committed herself to the cause of a free and independent Greek state. And I do not take uh, my nickname for, for granted. Bubalina spent her life fighting for Greece and rest assured I will always fight on your behalf as your, as your Philhellenic, Philhellenic woman in Congress because we are here to not only honor these brave women, but also the Greek people's contributions to democracy, art, science, and literature, and to governments around the world, including our own. As the birthplace of democracy, uh, Greece was an inspiration for the US system of government. And just as Greece inspired our country and revolution, our revolution helped inspire the Greeks to revolt against the Ottomans. So it should come as no surprise that when the Greek War of Independence started, American Philhellenes and Greek American communities 
in the US not only voiced their support for the cause, but actively participated in the campaign. Greek committees were formed in cities across our country to organize political and monetary support and send shiploads of humanitarian supplies to Greek revolutionaries. These American Philanines included Presidents Jefferson, Adams, Monroe, and other distinguished leaders like General Lafayette, William Townsend Washington, and Daniel Webster. Most notably, many of these American Philanines included future leaders of the women's suffrage and abolitionist movement. As American women became involved in the effort, they connected the battle against Greek slavery under the Ottoman Empire with other female-led reform movements, and over time, their participation grew into an international movement, expanding female participation in the public sphere for both American and Greek women. Emma Willard, who formed the Troy Society for the Advancement of Female Education in Greece, was one of the most outspoken advocates for the education of women. Sarah Arms Miller was involved in the women's suffrage movement and supported the Underground Railroad. She and her husband adopted a Hellenic orphan of the revolution, Lucas Miltiades Miller, who later became the first Greek American to serve in Congress. Indeed, many children orphaned during the Greek War of Independence were adopted by Americans and brought back to the US where they became prominent American scholars and members of our armed forces. Trailblazers like Bubalina, Willard, and Miller, who toppled their oppressors, demanded equality, and fought to enact change to benefit future generations of women, inspire my work in Congress today. I have tried to live up to their legacy by fighting for women's equality. When it comes to basic inclusions in our democracy, I have long fought for the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. Ratifying the ERA and finally getting it into the United States Constitution is a, a basic right, I believe, but has long been a, a battle. Fortunately, we're nearly there. This past spring, the House, we passed a bill that would eliminate the original deadline on the ERA, ERA and help get it certified once and for all. I have also long fought to eliminate violence against women in our country and in fact worked with now President-elect Biden on the first Violence Against Women Act that we passed in, 19, in, in 1995. Also for equal pay for equal work. And this year passed a bill uh, empowering 2.2 million federal workers and, and granting them paid parental leave for the birth of a child. Uh, the US government often is a model. We need to pass this in the country for all women. And my bill to create a Smithsonian Museum in our nation's capital uh, to honor the contributions of women passed in the House and in the Senate. It is now uh, fast tracked out of the committee in the Senate to pass. Apparently, uh, a, 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 a congressman named Lee from, uh, or rather, a senator named Lee from Utah has put a stop on it claiming that having a women's museum and a Latino museum would be divisive. I've heard a lot of arguments, but never that we have honoring women, half of our population is a divisive act. Uh, I've long felt that if you are going to empower women, you have to at least recognize them. And that is what this museum will do. Um, the, the example set by Hellenic and a Philhellenic women during the Greek War of Independence exemplifies the US-Greek relationship that thrives to this day. It is because of our historic friendship and shared commitment to democratic values that the US and Greece continue to work on so many issues that have a profound effect on our countries and the world. Issues like energy, economy, trade, to national security. I'm committed to doing everything possible to constantly strengthen and improve what is already one of our country's most important strategic alliances. With the support of friends here and across the Hellenic community, I'm always spearheading initiatives in Congress to show US support for Greece. I have introduced a resolution supporting the return of the Parthenon marbles back to Greece where they belong. Uh, the marbles were created by Greece, in Greece. They are a vital part of Greece's history 
and they belong to the Greek people. And I continue to advocate for an agreement for their return. I will also continue to defend the ecumenical patriarch from discrimination and have reintroduced a resolution calling on Turkey to cease any and all actions that violate the rights and religious freedoms of the ecumenical patriarch. And I've had the honor of going to Greece to meet him. I have also worked to ensure that no F-35 planes are sold to Turkey while it continues to engage in aggressive and illegal activities in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I've led letters to the State Department over and over again, urging them to go further and hold Turkey accountable for its illegal campaign of aggression in Eastern Mediterranean and, and, and violations of Greek sovereignty and will continue these efforts into the new administration. While the work never ends since the caucus was formed, I'm proud that we've prevented any legislation from passing Greece that could in, in any way weaken Greece. Uh, it used to have a pieces of legislation sponsored all the time. Since we created the Greek caucus, nothing has passed the United States Congress that does anything but empower Greece. As your ally in Congress, Greece and the Hellenic community can be sure that those of us who are proud to call ourselves your friends will always be there for you. And I must tell you, because of my uh, strong advocacy for Greece, one of the most often asked questions of me is, are you Greek? Are you Greek? <laughs> they can't believe that I'm not Greek, but you don't have to be uh, Greek to uh, battle for, for peace, justice, equality, and uh, for our great ally, our great friend, Greece. Thank you for including me. And I have a, this is such a special thing. Um, too often women's issues are swept under the floor and forgotten or not even recognized at all. And I thank uh, Lou and Marina honoring this and, and uh, putting this conference together with uh, recognized uh, educators and great artists and uh, women leaders uh, and Hellenic leaders is really very special. And especially this year, as we recognize the 100th anniversary of gaining that right to vote, uh, I have uh, passed a congressional record tribute for the conference, for what you're focusing on, for what you're working on, for what you want to accomplish. And it's in recognition of the East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance, EMCA. And I gave this on the floor. It just tells you you're great. I'm not going to read it. There's too much more that's important. Uh, but when you get depressed, Lou and Marina, you can read about yourselves in this conference and what you've done to put a spotlight on the contributions of half the population in America and Greece and what they have done, what they have contributed uh, to the uh, great relationship and, and history between our two uh, phenomenal countries. We've always been allies. We always will be. And I thank you uh, for having me. I'm deeply grateful and um, go on with the conference. And I, I will get this to you. Everything is harder during the pandemic. It's harder to speak to each other and to even move around. But I will get this to you, Marina, uh, for, for your uh, conference uh, history. So thank you. And I yield back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman from the East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance. We are so grateful for your leadership and we thank you for all you're accomplishing in the Congress. And we are just so grateful and, and love you and appreciate you and respect you for everything you're doing. And thank you for being part of our event today. Uh, Lou, did you have something to say to the Congresswoman? No, the only thing I have to say to the uh, to the congresswoman is she, she's just fantastic, and um, I, I I'm speechless actually. Uh, thank you so much, congresswoman. You know, as Marina said, we love you. Uh, we're going to support you, and anything you need from us, you're going to have anytime you want to. In my new job, it's a lot more work, and I'm going to have to go to another conference call with the Democratic leadership. We have a big week coming up. We have to pass a COVID relief bill uh, to the many people and small businesses that are suffering. Uh, but I'm going to have the tape so I can see it later on tonight and hear all your good words. And, and I, I just am so thrilled to meet all of you. Thank you, Anastasia, for your beautiful singing and Professor Thank you. Sattel, 
Uh, I can't wait to tell Jill Biden that I know one of her colleagues and uh, we're so excited about uh, the new president elect who is a great friend of Greece and, and his wife who I, I respect that she's, she has her own profession and will continue to pursue it. A very important one as a professor while being first lady. That is another first uh, historically that the first lady will continue in her own uh, field of education as an educator. It's a lot of first happening today. <laughs> we'll be watching the tape later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congresswoman. And so we will continue our discussion now with the next panelist, the prolific author, historian, professor emerita of Ionian University, Dr. Eleni Angelomatis Tsugarakis, who taught history of modern Hellenism from the 15th to the 19th centuries. She is the author of several books, including and articles, including Women in the War of Greek Independence in Networks of Power in Modern Greece, edited by Mark Mazauer. Her degrees are from the School of Philosophy, Athens University, and the PhD from Oxford University. She is the former research director of the Medieval and Modern Hellenism at the Academy of Athens. She is the author of several books and articles on Greece, Foreign Travelers in Greece, Greek Men of Letters During the Ottoman Era, The History of Education, The History of Women, Local Hellenic History. She is the author of Greece Before the War of Greek Independence, 1821, The Birth of a Nation State in Athens. I have the honor of welcoming Dr. Eleni Angelomatis Tsugarakis to tell us about Hellenic and Philhellenic women in the revolution. Is Dr. Angela? No, she has to unmute herself. She has to oh, unmute herself. Oh, please, Dr. It's okay now. I'm sorry about the interruption. Well, the honor is all mine. Thank you very much for the invitation. This was an honor and for your kind words. Well, uh, there are some years now that I'm involved in um, a history of women as such. And particularly about uh, this late stage before, the, before Greece becoming uh, the first national modern state after a revolution in Europe. As uh, I think Lou said before, uh, or perhaps it was Professor Santelli, I don't remember, uh, the American Revolution had been an inspiration for the Greek Revolution. It, it was the American Revolution rather than the French Revolution. The French Revolution, the French Revolution helped in preparing the spirit somehow of education, of uh, democratic uh, uh, ideas. But uh, the actual American Revolution and its success and the creation of a new democratic state, it was really an inspiration and with shouldn't forget that Corais, Professor Corais, was one of the correspondents of uh, Thomas Jefferson. And there, there has been a series of letters between the two men. And Corais was one of those people who inspired the revolution, although he didn't want it to be so soon because he thought that the nation wasn't prepared enough uh, to <laughs> face the event of a revolution and the establishment of a new state. Now, the revolution is not unconnected with uh, the celebration of the events that had been somehow the forerunners of the, of the revolution, the fight of uh, Suliotes for their freedom. So uh, the event we had uh, so nicely sung before about uh, how women of Suli fell to their death from the cliffs of their mountainous village is not unique. Several such inst uh, instances happened uh, during the revolution. There have been, I, we don't know exact numbers, but really, big numbers have happened of women falling uh, from cliffs or drowning in lakes or drowning in the sea 
to avoid being uh, taken prisoners. And then they knew that their fate had been, you know, more dire than death because they were sold as slaves uh, all over the East. And the description of um, some of their stories is so horrific that it's unbelievable. A woman was sold 40 times within 24 hours and some were mutilated, some were, you know, you can imagine the horrible things you can imagine are all true. <clears throat> anyway, we mostly associate women in the war, uh, in the war with Greek independence with those ladies we see behind Marina, uh, the famous Bubulina uh, and Mandoma of uh, They were very unlike. They were both from islands, the Greek islands of the Aegean, but they couldn't be more unlike. Both, however, have inspired the Greeks. And uh, although people nowadays are not so very uh, aware of the history of the Greek Revolution, uh, if you ask them to mention two of the most important fighters during the War of Independence, they would say Kolokotronis, who had been the chief, uh, uh, we say Archistratigos, but you know, it's, it's just, just an honor to say, uh, it was different from what we really now mean uh, uh, Stratigos, uh, general. He was an inspiration to his, his fighters and his troops. So one is Kolokotronis, the other is Bubulina. Everybody knows Bubulina, although they don't actually know a lot of things about them. Uh, even the Greek, modern Greek state, a couple of years ago in uh, 2018, decided to honor yet again Bubulina by conferring to her uh, posthumously uh, the rank of the general, I think it's uh, not general, uh, rear admiral posthumously and very, you know, uh, <clears throat> lots of others uh, honors like uh, uh, the, the cross of uh, whatever it's called, uh, uh, brave acts or whatever. So even now, it's something that is considered, you know, very modern, very up to date. It's in everyday life somehow. Mondova Brigamus is not so well known. Uh, they, they can't put her in some context easily, but nevertheless, she is still known. So the two ladies have become, have come in the somehow uh, very, uh, no, let's put it, they, they are still in the unconscious mind of Greece, uh, of the, the collective, subconscious mind uh, of Greece, among other men who fought during the War of Independence. Now, there is a problem. We don't know many women by name, you know, actually fighting during the war. Although most women, one way or another, participated and uh, helped as uh, Lou had taught me again, there's no war uh, to be fought without women playing a part in them. So this is true. Women helped in, many, in various ways. They worked hard, they starved, they helped uh, bringing ammunition and food, uh, whatever it was needed uh, to the fighters. Uh, all on food and uh, heavily burdened, like beasts of burdens. Uh, they acted as spies, they made ammunition, they 
carried letters back and forth. So in various ways they had been active, uh, but those do not usually meant, and since they were collective deeds, uh, they don't have a name. All those collective deeds are the anonymous women who helped along the other men, the several hundred, several thousand other men who fought in the revolution, they don't still have a name. So we shouldn't forget them as well when we speak about people fighting the revolution. There were numerous women who fought and numerous men whom we don't know about still. Now about those very important figureheads of the Greek revolution, Bubulina. Bubulina was a middle-aged woman, rather fat, not impressively looking, but she was a very, very competent woman. Uh, she was from Idra, her family was from Idra, but she, during her two marriages to out of men, she became a figurehead in Spetsas rather than her mother island. Um, she had six children by those two marriages. Three of her boys were killed during the revolution. But perhaps I should have said first that uh, widows had, uh, generally widows, had many more advantages that the other women in Greece at that time, because they were more free and sometimes they ran their business together, they were head of their families, so they were able to perform more significant things than other women, single or married. So um, Bulina being a widow, a rich widow, managed to increase her fortune, the fortune of her family. She managed to build, just before the revolution, a couple of years before the revolution, a very big uh, ship called Agamemnon with four, uh, 78 cannons on it. And she ran a very profitable business with her small uh, fleet of four boats. I'm not quite sure what kind of boats were. Uh, I'm ignorant in that respect. Anyway, she joined the revolution and during the very few first years, she spent all her assets in the war because she ran and she carried all the expenses of running her small fleet to help the war wherever it was needed. She participated um, in the siege of, uh, with her fleet, with uh, Gamemnon, uh, of uh, Nafplion and of the fortress of Monemvasia. She herself uh, took part in the siege of Tripolita. And she was very active. And she was the only woman we actually know that she was part of the political uh, scene at the time because uh, she, she had the strength and she had the, ma uh, the money and she had her fleet. So she was someone uh, the other fighters and the politicians had to, to, to take her into account. Uh, she, ma she gave her, uh, her daughter Eleni to marriage uh, to Kolokotronis' elder son, elder son, Panos, who was a well-educated man. He was not just cleft like his father. He was a well-educated man and very uh, like, uh, he was easily um, adapted to circumstances and he was well-liked by most people and he was married to Eleni, who was at the time just around 17 years old, very young. And uh, through this uh, marriage, the two big names in the land, in the Peloponnese and in the, in the islands, uh, Bubulina, 
were connected. So there was a political affiliation through the, this marriage. Uh, but, so uh, Bubulina was connected with Kolokotronis' faction and she suffered for this because uh, when uh, Kolokotronis was imprisoned uh, during the civil wars, she was obliged to retire after you know, several troubles. So she retired to her island, to Spetses, where unfortunately she was killed for a very <laughs> strange reason, at least for us right now. Uh, one of her sons from the first marriage abducted uh, a lady from another rich and powerful family of Spetses, the Kutis family. And during a family feud that happened, she was shot dead. So in very early on in 1825, Bobolina was killed. Now, Mandoma was very different. She was a very good family as well. Uh, her father was a merchant. She had uh, an older uncle who had been uh, a prince at uh, the now Romania at the time, Wallachia and uh, Moldavia. Uh, Nicholas Mavrogenis, uh, who was afterwards killed by the Sultan, was executed. And she was a rich lady. She had a great dowry. And uh, she spoke at least two languages. You know, uh, Philelines, who had met her, uh, described her as elegant, dressed in European fashion, and uh, fluent in Italian and uh, uh, French. Um, she spent, during the war of independence, she spent all her money, she spent all her fortune. She was obliged to uh, borrow money in order to uh, finance um, bands of men to go and fight to the Peloponnese, to fight to Hills, to fight to Caristos. Uh, it is said that she participated in this Caristos expedition, but this is not, you know, made certain uh, from any uh, real documents. Anyway, she had spent 2,000 uh, piastres at the time, that was a very considerable uh, fund in order to uh, make this uh, expedition happen. Uh, we know that because there is a a document signed by Dimitris of Silandis that states that she did have spent that money for the expedition. The only fight we know for sure that she took part was when uh, Mykonos, her native island, uh, suffered um, uh, an attack from pirates, Algerian pirates. And at that time she put herself on, uh, at the head of a band of about 200 men, and she was able to send back all those uh, Algerian pirates. Otherwise, she was very unfortunate in everything else. Uh, at some point, she was engaged to Dimitris of Silandis, uh, general at the time, Everybody knows that he was uh, the brother of Alexander Sipsilandis, who was uh, head of the revolution. And everybody describes as Ypsilandis as a nice person, but and a good Greek, but not really competent for the part he wanted to play in the war of the Greek independent. And so at some point he was engaged to uh, Manto. Manto is uh, Magdalene, for those who don't know, um, Modlin. And uh, we don't know why. It is said that uh, his friends and uh, counselors advised him to not marry her. 
So he breached his promise and they were not married. Mandog was devastated by that. In fact, uh, she ended up by suing him for a breach of promise. I suppose it was not just out of spite, but at the time it was some sort of dishonor, dishonorable thing for a woman to be discarded like that, because it might suppose, you know, make people suppose that there was something really wrong. Uh, she was not an honorable woman or something like that. I can't give another explanation because she was a reasonable lady and she didn't have any other reason to sue him for breach of promise. But uh, although she referred to, to the National Assembly uh, trying to find her whatever she thought was uh, satisfaction uh, to that uh, event, she failed. She also failed to retrieve the money she had borrowed for various reasons and uh, the things that had been taken away from her and whatever. And she ended up uh, in very bad uh, state of uh, poverty. And she was uh, somehow rejected by most of her family. And finally, she had to live by the meager uh, pensions of some sort of help, of financial help, given after her petitions by Kapodistrias and later by King Otto. Uh, she died a pauper, really, in Paros, after the Greek state was established, Greek modern, modern Greek state was established, and she was uh, buried dressed with men's clothes. I have to add two things, but at the time it cross-dressing was rather common and it was not disapproved because women, either women who fought or women who had to flee or women who had to follow the troops uh, dressed in, uh, women, in men's clothes because that made it more possible to be killed rather than get caught and taken as a prisoner. The fate was, you know, worse than death. So women were dressed in uh, men's clothes often during the exodus from Salangi. Most of the younger women were dressed in men's clothes. And uh, there is a story, uh, which is uh, after that, several years afterwards, was written by General Macris, one of the people who had fought Mussolini, that an old lady who died at that time, uh, she had asked to be dressed with the men's clothes she used to wear uh, during the Exodus, because she was pride for her participation and for her being dressed with, in men's clothes. So Mando was dressed in, in uh, men's clothes. Two more things, uh, or the, the second of the, of the two things. Uh, it's usually said that most, by most of uh, uh, people who write about uh, women uh, that uh, both Bobulina and Mando had been part of the Filiketeria. This is not confirmed. But none of the surviving lists of uh, uh, members of the Filiketeri and those two women are not included. So we don't know for sure. I suppose they were not really, but it has been proved either way. The only woman we know, at least it is said so by a reliable source that She's not included in the, uh, in the list, but uh, it is said by Philemon, one of the first people who, he, he was the secretary of uh, Ypsilantis 
and he has given one of the lists of the participants of Filketeria. The only woman known to be member of Filketeria was uh, the wife of a doctor, a Greek doctor, Naftis was his name, uh, in Smyrna. And she had found by chance secret documents of the Eteria. And after that, uh, her husband conf conferred with other members and they decided to initiate her. So they did. Uh, she took the oath and uh, offered 3,000 piastres for the Eteria. Uh, that was Kiryaki Nafti who later, we find her let, much later in uh, 1829, Sira, and she was uh, in the committee who ran a, a school for girls in Sira in 1829. That was the only known woman uh, member of the Filgeteria. And another thing, although we know about uh, the conference of uh, title to Bubulina, we don't know for sure that, uh, as it is often said, that uh, any particular title, uh, military title, has been confirmed, conferred to Mando while she was alive. So that means that, uh, in a way, things we know, we don't really know so well. And as far as Mando is concerned, we know a lot about her private life and her private troubles, but not so many things about the actual participation of uh, the Eteria and the, um, the fights that took place. Uh, I think her fame uh, became more widespread through the Philelines who met her and were impressed by her and by the letters, two letters in fact, sent one to the Philelene ladies to England and the other to the Philelene ladies in France. Uh, so she became well known. She was more close to the European or the American uh, icon of a woman fighter rather than uh, other people. Bubulina was said to be in Greece a phenomenon and an exceptional human being. And everybody was thinking that she was a very, you know, powerful sort of woman, but she was nothing very attractive to the Philippines. And I will end with very few words because I'm taking too much time, I'm afraid, about uh, two ladies uh, Lou mentioned briefly. One was Emaniatisa, a woman of uh, Laconia or Sparta, as often is referred to, uh, Stavren, Stavriana Savena, Savena from her husband, George Savas, who was killed by the Turks uh, in the early part of the 1821. She was a woman in her forties. Uh, she was, as we say in Greek, androgyneka. I mean, she was tall. She was uh, rather, she was not quiet because she was a woman with five children working outside and she was not uh, something like Mando at all. And she fought with the Kiryakulis Mavromichalis troops on several occasions um, in uh, Tripolica, in Valterci in particular. And she's described as being the one who went out of Taburia, those sort of half self-made uh, sort of bastions. I can't find a, any proper word for this. Uh, she, because they did not communicate between themselves, between those. And um, she had to run from one to the other, uh, carrying information, uh, ammunition, things like that. And several other 
um, fights out and battles outside the Peloponnese because she was following the troops there. That's the only occasion we know of a woman following other troops outside of the Peloponnese. Uh, it's not so certain, although it is said that Zaharia's daughter Kosadina did the same, but it's not really uh, confirmed. So she fought as much as she could, but she ended up being painless with having five children to feed. And she applied to the government asking uh, for some pension and help. And she submitted several uh, documents written by well-known fighters, Kyriakoulis Mavromichalis, Dimitris Melitopoulos, uh, the Plirexusis, the, the representatives of Karitana, uh, stating that she had fought in those and those battles during uh, uh, the war. And she was given a small, you know, a small pension uh, for later life. And Katerina Zakharia, who we mentioned briefly, is, is known mostly because uh, Blacker and Pukvili uh, referred to her. She was uh, young. Uh, she, was, she was supposed to lead a small band of men. Uh, Pukvil's account of her is so romantic and so exaggerated that uh, for historians, is, uh, you know, not something to rely on very much. But uh, Blacker says that uh, who had met her in person in Gastuni, where she had retired because she had been uh, uh, during, during battle, she was. Uh, uh, she had some sort of trouble and uh, she had been retired for a while to recover. And he, he, he says, Blacker says that uh, uh, the chief of the, this place, Sicinis, had guaranteed that whatever she had told him was true. Uh, she had fought in the seats of Patras as well. And after some time, we lose track of her. Uh, Blackie said that he had tried to, he had persuaded her to retire and he had promised to secure some sort of small pension for her living through the uh, London um, Learning Society. We don't know what happened. You see, lots of things have been written by by nearly everybody who had taken part uh, and had leading role in the, in the revolution, but not so many documents survive. And those that survive have not been properly examined because there is such a serendipity of uh, documents all over the place. And there are so many accounts and it's so very difficult to, uh, combine all those and find the real truth about all those things. But the fact is that women fought, women suffered. Women suffered not only as slaves, not only as surviving paupers in their own place, in their burnt houses and having to, 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 to feed starving children and having to, to secure some pounds of uh, flowers sent by the states and being dressed by clothes sent by the Philhellenic women from the states and having to live mm -hmm. in huts made out of branches of trees and live in, uh, in caves. And some of them never been free after all, either because they remained slaves and they have, they were never <clears throat> ransomed or because they stayed in parts of Greece that had not been liberated after all at the end of the revolution. So uh, there is so much to be said about the half of, 
or more than half, if you include the children uh, of the population of Greece at that time. So I'll try to finish my book, but I'm sure it won't be enough. Uh, we look forward to your book, Dr. Angela Mati. And I, and I, I, thank you for this. <laughs> for <laughs> listening to me ranting for so much. <laughs> oh, no. It was our pleasure. We have so much to learn. And, you know, the her heroism of these women in your presentation is, is it, it just tears my heart to think of what they suffered and what they accomplished to give us our freedom. And we must continue to tell these stories. And, and it will show us the way to the future so that history does not repeat. We must know our history. And I thank you for bringing our history to us in such a profound way so that we can go forward. All the thanks are from my side. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm pleased now to introduce our next speaker, which is Maria Kaliambu. Dr. Kaliambu is a senior lecturer at the Hellenic Studies Program at Yale University. She teaches folklore, modern Greek language, and she is a specialist in the myths of the Greek warrior women, which is so interesting that we don't know the facts as well as we should in history, but we do know the myths, which were the, the myths that were, were given to us in the folk tales by our grandmothers. And uh, Dr. Kaliambu is also uh, working on a book about home, faith, family, and values in Greek popular booklets and tales. And uh, she is the author of the Rutledge Modern Greek Reader, Folk Tales for Learning Modern Greek. Uh, her PhD is from the University of Munich in Germany. Uh, she's taught at Princeton at the University Charles de Gaulle. Her dissertation received the prestigious Lutz Rorich Prize in Germany for the best dissertation in oral literature. So I'm very pleased and honored to introduce Dr. Kaliambu, who's going to tell us about the folk tales of Greek warrior women. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation and congratulations for this great event and all, you, uh, all what you are doing. EMPCA is very active and uh, I admire your strength, like, uh, like a warrior strength. And uh, thank you also, Professor Angelomatis, for this uh, great overview of the women in the revolution. It is a challenge for me to be in between of two historians. Professor Angelomatis and Professor Santelli. As you heard, I'm folklorist ethnologist and my focus is on uh, um, folk literature. So I would like to bring a different dimension to our discussion. Let me shift the focus from reality to myth, from history to imagination, from the real warrior women to fantastic women with extraordinary power. In folk tales, folk legends, and folk songs, there is a recurring motif of the heroic warrior women. With my brief contribution today, I would like to honor the anonymous women who showed braveness, courage, selflessness, and patriotism. And as Professor Angelomatis said, the majority of the women were anonymous. So many really took place in those battles, and we don't know about them. So, uh, Allow me to give you some folk tales. Well, one, I will not read the, uh, yeah, the whole story, but I will give you the brief plots, the, the main plots. Uh, there are several types of folk tales about the brave actions of a young woman who dresses as a man and goes to the war. We just heard that this cross-dressing, Professor Angelomatis mentioned that. So let me focus on one story with the title Theodora in the Army, I Theodora Stom Strato. So this is a folk tale uh, and goes as follows. Uh, once upon a time, there was a father with three daughters. He was disquiet because an order came for him to join the army. However, his youngest daughter immediately volunteered to take her father's part in the war, whereas the first two daughters didn't care at all. So she says, I quote, give me your clothes and your gun and your horse and I will go in your place. 
She cut her hair and went to the war where she demonstrated power, strength, and many successful actions. Uh, in the army, this girl found a companion and became friends. The friend liked her and believed that she was not a man. And he said, Theodora it is, not Theodore. And for her, my heart is sore. And in Greek, Thodoros, Thodora miazi, tin kardia mu maragiazi. So the friend tried to discover uh, the real gender of um, this companion. So they visit a bazaar. If the trick is following, if Theodora buys bracelets and jewelry, then she's a woman. But Theodora was clever enough and looked for pistols. And, and she said to him, what do you want to do with bracelets? Are you a girl? So the companion could not initially find her real gender. So she does not, she can hide her gender that she's a woman. After three years in the war, the companion was convinced that Theodora was a girl, not a Theodore, but Theodora. And as they were all asleep, he put a charm on her and carried her off to his house. So she, he put her on sleep, yeah? So when Theodora woke up, she blushed and refused to speak. The man told her that he loves her and wants to make her his wife, but she said no word so that everybody thought she was uh, dumb and mute. So this man betrothed himself to another woman. So we have a complication in the story. Uh, Theodora, of course, could not accept that and she wanted to break this uh, marriage. At the wedding ceremony, Theodora lit a candle and set up a fire to her sleeve. She set up a fire on herself. The bride saw the fire and cried out to help the mute girl. Help her, she's gonna be burned. Although brides are not supposed to speak. Then Theodora said to her, I quote, I never spoke for three years and you begin to speak so quickly. And then the bridegroom asked her to marry saying, so modest was she for three years. And she said, not a word. And so they lived happily ever after, and may we live yet better. Here is the motif of the silence for those who don't know, brides are not supposed to speak before the wedding. And actually also after the wedding is one of the folk customs that are still, uh, still prevalent in uh, rural areas in Greece. So she was, yeah, mute enough. So to summarize again the tale, the tale starts with the girl going to the war, replacing her father. Then a male companion falls in love with her and tries to find her real gender by putting difficult tasks on her. Her female gender is discovered. The man abducts her and takes her to his home. At the end, they get married after some complications with another betrothed woman. So this folk tale, as others of similar types have the central motif of the warrior women. In this tale, she keeps her female gender and gets married at the end. In other folktale types, there is a gender reverse. At the end, she gets transformed into a man so that she marries a woman, usually the princess, who falls in love with her, him. So we find such tales of the warrior women in all regions in Greece, particularly in the mountain areas. The heroines of the folk tales they do something extraordinary that was allowed only to men, yet they wanted to be included to the society, not be alienated from the rest of their peers. These folk stories are connected with local histories. They reflect, to my opinion, history symbolically. Thus, they refer indirectly to these women of the revolution that we talk about today. These folk stories may have been used for the national purposes during the 19th and 20th century. Uh, women dressed as men was very common during the revolution. We just heard from Professor Angelomatis that in the exodus of Mesolonghi, women were dressed as men because they preferred to be taken uh, as men and to be killed rather than to be alive uh, and taken as slaves. And we just heard that dressing seemed to be appropriate, dressing as a man seemed to be appropriate for women who participate in the camps or traveling alone. And women were also proud if they were dressed as men. 
And I will not, yes, yeah, Professor just mentioned uh, the example I wanted also to mention to you that uh, an old woman, survivor of the Exodus, who asked to be buried in, the, she was asked, she asked to be buried in the men's clothing that she had been wearing at that time. Also, Mando Mavrogenus in 1840 was buried in general's uniform, although, as we know, Mando uh, got to rest in European uh, clothing. So uh, let me move to another genre, namely folk song. In folk poetry, we also have the motif of the brave women as uh, warriors. In Byzantine poetry, I will go very briefly on those so that we uh, have time for the discussion. In Byzantine poetry, in the cycle of the Dianis Akritas, we find the type of the Andriomeni, the brave woman, uh, but this type of woman is uh, um, described with supernatural uh, power. Also the acritic songs, which are songs, folk songs from the border of the Byzantine empire. Uh, we have example of women fighting for justice or, re or revenge. For instance, in a song from Pontus, a mother is disguised as a man and fights the Saracens because they killed her sons. Now, the cleftic songs, we find the motif of the girl cleft, namely a girl disguised as a man fighting together with other clefts. Uh, I will very briefly mention what are clefts for those who don't know in our audience. Clefts are bandits and they were regarded by, uh, as criminals by the law, uh, but as carriers of justice by the folk imagination. Thus, narrators were inspired by stories related to their lives and actions. So in one of the first collections of folk songs by Claude Foriel in 1824, uh, we have songs that describe the heroism and selflessness of Suliotises. And Foriel, uh, the French scholar, inspired other French Philhellenists, for instance, the painter, Ari Sheffer, whose painting was presented in Paris in 1827. The painting, this art, however, is disconnected from the historical reality and demonstrates more a love to the exotic and strange rather than depicting the historical event. In another folk song collection in 1843 by Evlampios, uh, there is a song about the famous Suliotisa Diamanto, Turks killed all her relatives and she decided to seek revenge. She joined the group of clefts and for many years was not recognized. She even became the chief of them, Capetanios. Uh, other girl cleft songs, in other songs we see the type of the girl who asks her lover to take her with him so that they are united and she doesn't want to be left behind. The girls have names in these cleftic songs. The most common is, as you can imagine, Helen. Um, I think by giving names to the heroine, to the heroines, to the girls, folk poetry comes closer to reality or narrates reality in a different way. There are also songs, folk songs, about the battles in Napoleon where Bubulina, and named Bubulina, where she also um, participated. The main characteristic element of those songs is the braveness and courage of these girls' clefts. They are based, these songs are based on real episodes and narrating the experiences of the folk. I will finish with a, a legend uh, where women take the arms. This is a legend of the cycle of Alexander the Great. So, Vasilias Alexandros, King Alexander and Karagunides. This is a legend from Thessaly. Um, let me briefly explain. King Alexander had a war, but his men abandoned him. The women, when they were bringing water to the soldiers, and here we see what other actions actually women had, what other roles they had during the war, they bringing water and food. Uh, uh, the women saw the men's cowardice and immediately took the place of their men, took their armaments and fought bravely and won. Alexander the Great wanted to award the women's braveness and punish men's cowardice. So he set an order so that men wear the women, so that men wear the headscarves of the women and women wear the helmets of men. 
and this legend explains why the local folk costume uh, carries helmets for women and scarves for men. Um, the legends have an explanatory role for the society. So, and I finish. Folk traditions, folk tales, folk songs, legends narrate about women in armors. These women have to be disguised as men in order to be allowed to enter the male domain of war. In order to understand the folk tales and the folk literature in general, we need to know the historical and the socioeconomic context. As mentioned, in folk tales, women are anonymous, whereas in some folk songs and legends, we have some historical references about them. However, my, thesis, my point is that the anonymous fairy tale girl soldier is rooted into society, is part of the social lives and folk imagination. It finds its equivalent in actual reality. This explains also the spread and popularity of those stories. These stories are prevalent in whole Greece, mainly in the um, um, mountain areas, but also on the islands. They are very mm -hmm. well spread stories. So the battles, the heroic fights during the revolution were a source of inspiration for those narrators of folk tales and songs. Stories about brave women live in the collective memory. The borders between myth and reality are blurred, which makes these stories even more fascinating to us. And I thank you with this. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalyan. We are so grateful to you for really bridging our oral history uh, of the women, the Greek warrior women. I remember some of the stories my grandmother gave me and perhaps other people do as well and how much those are really part of who we are as Hellenic and Philhellenic women. Um, I'm very grateful to you and I know we're gonna have more in the discussion. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Maureen Connor Santelli, the author of the newly published book by Cornell University Press, the Greek Fire, American Ottoman Relations and Democratic mm -hmm. Fervor in the Age of Revolutions. <clears throat> Professor Santelli teaches at North Virg Northern Virginia Community College where we know she's a, uh, a colleague of Dr. Jill Biden, our new first lady. Uh, she teaches American history and Western civilization and the ancient world. Her research brings together her expertise in classical history with global history during the era of the early American Republic. Her book examines how American popular support for the Greek War of Independence during the 1820s and 30s developed into a practical school for political action, aiding the rise of the abolitionist movement and the women's suffrage and female education and women's rights. Her dissertation, The Greek Fire, the Greek War of Independence and the Emergence of American Reform Movement 1780 to 1860 is now the new book published. Congratulations. Um, the Greek Fire is something we're going to hear more about, the Philhellenic, Philhellenic Movement, which pushed the borders of U.S. interests into the Eastern Mediterranean and gave a global perspective to American conversations regarding freedom and reform. Please welcome Professor Santelli. Dr. Santelli. Thank you so much for having me on this discussion. I've really enjoyed the panelists so far. It's been great to hear about the Hellenic women to get that side of it. And I, I enjoyed hearing about the, the myths uh, because I, while I'm not as familiar with the Hellenic myths themselves, uh, those types of stories were actually used very commonly in uh, the United States to help uh, garner support for the Philhellenic movement. So it's a really great parallel there. So what I'm going to do is provide um, an overview of the Philhellenic movement, specifically with um, how women became involved in the movement, and then just to outline some of their contributions um, to the movement. And then in discussion, um, we can perhaps get to more of the legacy of the Philhellenic movement in terms of um, reform movements in the antebellum period, such as um, abolitionism and women's rights. So female support for the Greek revolution in the United States was a popular movement that brought together elite and middle-class uh, women from countless benevolent social and religious groups of the 1820s. Their goal was to spread beneficence to war-torn Greece, 
but it also paved the way for a practical education and grassroots organi organizing at a national as well as international level. The Greek Revolution made an impression on future political rhetoric in the United States, as we we're just saying, um, influencing, for example, abolitionism and women's rights. Before organized benevolence in the United States embraced the cause, the Greek War for Independence was closely linked to the international Philhellenic movement, which was initially dominated by men. This was an intellectual trend that looked back to ancient Greece as the source of Western democracy and freedom. The Philhellenic interest in saving the Greeks stemmed in part anyway from the fact that the Greeks were Christians, but many Europeans and Americans viewed the Greeks as the wrong kind of Christians, given that they were Orthodox. Instead, support was born from the romantic hope that ancient Greece could somehow be revived through their intercession. The belief that the Greeks could not obtain freedom without assistance fueled a sense of urgency. And from the religious and social reform aspects of the movement, female benevolence fit with these goals. 19th century female-centered reform groups focused on a range of charitable efforts that included aid for the orphaned and destitute and education reform. Instead of being viewed as improper or radical, women who participated in these charitable organizations were admired for their true womanhood in aiding the community and society in general. Benevolent societies were especially popular among white elite and middle-class Protestant women in both Northern and Southern states, um, where a dedication to Christianity and family justified participation in the civic and political affairs of local communities. Enthusiasm for ancient Greece entwined with dedication to the Greek cause as part of a global outreach for social and religious reform. Female interest in Greece coincided with providing aid for destitute mothers, their children, Protestant evangelism, and education. Americans felt they shared the plight of the modern Greeks more so than European Philhellens because they had fought and won their own revolution. Um, this is especially the, for the British Philhellens. It was almost like there was a competition between them. Um, the United States' relationship with the Ottoman Empire also played an influential and complicated role in how Americans supported the modern Greeks. A dislike and mistrust for the Muslim world was already extant within the United States by the end of the 18th century, but intensified through the Barbary Wars. The nostalgic connection to ancient Greece, combined with the fact that modern Greeks were living under Ottoman rule, cultivated early American interest in advocating for Greek independence and the restoration of a Greece that more resembled its ancient political origins. The early organization of the Philhellenic movement in the United States was largely achieved through the efforts of two individuals, classical Harvard scholar Edward Everett and Philadelphia printer and philanthropist Matthew Carey. While these two men were internationally recognized for their support for the Greek Revolution, both relied on the involvement of women. Women directed their efforts toward gathering supplies, clothes, and later organized efforts to recruit teachers for newly built schools in Athens. A key reason that American women were especially drawn to the Greek cause and saw it as an extension of their existing charitable work was through their understanding of female life in the Ottoman Empire. For early Americans who saw the moral stability of a nation as originating in the home with the wife and mother, the harem was viewed as the ultimate manifestation of depravity and de despotism. American women imagined Greek women as the ultimate group of victims, not only because that they were subjects under the Turks, but also because of that link to ancient Greece. When the United States government refused to officially assist Greece, female religious and social groups increasingly organized practical assistance for the Greek cause by 1824. Female-led groups organized efforts at the local level to raise funds for Greek civilians. It is difficult to say exactly how much these groups sent to Greece, but a conservative estimate would place the number in the tens of thousands of dollars. 
funds were raised in a variety of ways, including knocking on doors, advertising in newspapers, giving public speeches, carnivals, and even balls. These organized efforts primarily took place in the more urban areas of the Northern states, including New York City, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Boston. Although much of the more active organizations existed in Northern cities, activity also took place throughout Southern communities. Female support for the Greek war accelerated in response to a series of setbacks sustained by the Greek army. Um, the death of Lord Byron at the Greek controlled city of Missolonghi in April of 1824, especially piqued interest. And then the fall of Missolonghi also generated quite a lot of interest as well. Newspaper reports after the death of Lord Byron um, that uh, it reported that the Greek fund of New York alone successfully dispatched a contribution in the amount of $6,000 in the early summer and an additional $5,000 uh, more uh, by August. Public interest only continued to accelerate in the midst of what would become known as the Greek frigate scandal, an incident that involved a New York shipbuilding company where they mismanaged the construction of two ships for the Greek Navy. Greeks were possibly suffering military and civilian loss due to the actions of US shipbuilders, a consequence that American supporters of the Greek cause considered a national embarrassment. In every locality where a Greek committee existed, there is convincing evidence to suggest that women were a driving force behind collecting subscriptions and coordinating events for the Greek cause. Many Greek committees had ladies subcommittees, making women a recognized asset to each organization. While committee account books and receipts in New York and Philadelphia repeatedly list donations made or collected by female groups. In communities where there were no local ladies subcommittees, women of the community gathered on their own accord and collected funds frequently sending the proceeds to the larger committees of Philadelphia and New York. By the height of female involvement in the Greek cause, ladies groups primarily directed their efforts at gathering food and clothing for Greek civilians. The ladies of Providence, Rhode Island and surrounding communities alone produced over 3000 items of clothing, which were sent to the New York committee. In Hartford, Connecticut, women advertised that they were collecting subscriptions in order to purchase uh, materials for clothing and provisions. And in Boston, a meeting of ladies designated four places of deposit where articles of money contributed for the relief of the Greeks could be received. Even in smaller communities such as Canada New York, local ladies set to work with their needles in making clothing for the Greek women and children. At least some African-American women were involved in the Greek cause since one, re one paper reported that ladies and gentlemen of color in New York had given a benefit for the Greek cause. According to this report, the participants were so enthusiastic that the company did not disperse until six in the morning. Female Greek aid societies also provided monetary support and funds for education to Greek refugees um, in the United States, as well as the construction of schools in Greece. With the combined cooperation of Philhellenic ladies organizations, religious groups, and the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, the first American-run schools in Greece were established in 1828. The American Board of Missions worked in conjunction with the Ladies Greek Committee of New York and the founder of the first female institution for higher learning in the United States, Emma Willard. Willard held that, there, that the way a nation educated its women revealed how civilized that society was as a whole. Supported by other local women, she created a charitable society focused on building schools for Greek girls that they named the Troy Society for the Advancement of Female Education in Greece. Willard enjoyed support from a number of individuals and groups that advocated for female education. Uh, this included Samuel Gridley Howe, an American physician who had served in the Greek Revolution, and Sarah Buell Hale, editor of the Ladies Magazine and Literary Gazette. By 1830, through the cooperative efforts of the Greek government and American Greek aid societies, the American Board of Missions had established three schools, all containing 534 pupils. Under the immediate direction of Reverend Jonas King, a school in Athens opened and quickly grew to more than 100 scholars. 
King also established a school for girls at Tinos, an island not far from Athens. And by 1835, Willard and her supporters through the Athens-based American Ladies Institute helped to provide education to nearly 500 female students in that year alone in 1835. So in addition to the aid that these Philhellenic women provided to Greek civilians, the legacy of these efforts also provided them with a foundation for increased female involvement in organized reform at both home and abroad. The rhetoric used by these Greek aid societies became infused with reform groups in the United States in general and played a part in the emerging abolitionist and women's rights movements that followed in the preceding decades. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santali, that was wonderful. So this is now the open part of our discussion. Um, I will turn it over to Lou so that we can maybe talk about some of the questions that we've come up come up with. I'm sure you have some questions, Lou. No, no, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave the questions to you, but I, I will make some comments. I, I, I hate to make some comments, but I'll, I'll make some comments because I don't want to take away from the discussion. And by the way, We'll continue the discussion as long as it takes because this is a fantastic, fantastic topic. I, I will say a few things. I, I think uh, to Eleni, that Eleni, there's a lot missing. And we're so happy that you're uh, putting together a book on the woman of the revolution because a lot is missing in the history, quite frankly. Uh, I happen to be from the mountainous areas that Maria was talking about in terms of the woman uh, in the mountains and the cleftic woman and all the rest of that. I'm a believer that quite frankly, the folk songs have, have a lot to do with reality. And to Eleni's point that, that there's not enough material written uh, around that period, it, it has to be understood that the people of those areas in many cases did not, were not educated. They did not know how to write uh, or read. And in many cases, the, the oral history uh, becomes extremely important. There were there are three there are three uh, images behind uh, Marina. Uh, there was a discussion by Eleni of uh, Bubulina, and there was a discussion of uh, by Eleni of Manto. But the woman right behind right behind uh, Marina is is a maniatico a maniatisa a woman from Mani, and uh, the woman of Mani, for example, uh, during the revolution. And during the invasion, because uh, don't forget that the Ottomans were losing the war in the, in the Moria, or what we call the Peloponnesus. They asked um, uh, Ali Pasha of Egypt, not the one of Yanina, to send some forces uh, to, uh, to overcome what was taking place in the Peloponnesus. And he sent his son, uh, uh, you know, um, Ibrahim Pasha who came with Egyptian forces, thousands of, of forces, and literally uh, took over again the Moria. But when they went into Mani and they fought, for example, uh, they tried to get into Mani and in the battle of what we call Verga, the Maniates were fighting in Verga, but meanwhile, meanwhile, Ibrahim Pasia's forces, he sent some forces into Diru, where now there are caves of Diru that we all know are very famous. Mm. And in the Battle of Diru, which would have caused, which would have caused actually the Maniatas to be surrounded, the woman, the woman of Diru, one of them is behind Marina right now, the one in the center, and you can't see her, her, her uh, the bottom of her hand, but she's holding basically a skiff. They fought off the Ottomans, and out of the 1,500 that landed in Diru, a thousand uh, were killed. Uh, so the women of, uh, of Diru were called the Amazons of Diru. That's one example, for example, of, of women fighting within the revolution. We talked about before of Mosko Zavela, who with 400 women in one of the battles, in particular in, uh, in, um, in 1792, I believe it was, in Kiafa, 400 women, again, were battle and fought off the, the Ottomans and, and, uh, and again defeated and caused uh, major damage. What I'm really trying to say is this, that, that the history of, of Hellenic women in the revolution, things that are talked about in terms of Maria, what Maria was discussing in terms of the folk songs, 
there are there are a lot of missing pieces to it, a lot of missing pieces to it. It's uh, it's it's hard to believe knowing the woman of those mountainous areas. And when we talk about Greece, people should know that it's one of the most mountainous areas in all of Europe. And those women in particular fought with the men. It's it's it's. I understand. I understand, Eleni. That there's missing, there's missing uh, written, and and that's what historians do. They're interested in written uh, aspects that they can prove something. But I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there were in fact uh, Western travelers in the 1700s, etc., who went through those areas. And I think there was examples of women pulling out pistols and actually shooting people, shooting men, who in fact uh, uh, made the wrong statements about them. Because in those particular time periods, if you made the wrong statement about somebody, uh, especially in the mountains, uh, if the women didn't kill you, the men would kill you, quite frankly. So people had to be had to be very careful. I, I will say that uh, that there's a lot of missing pieces, and that hopefully uh, this particular panel discussion will incorporate a lot of that. The other thing is that that the influence, the influence of the revolution in terms of not only Europe, but certainly the United States, and in particular, uh, uh, to Professor Santini's point, the, the, the influence of the Hellenic Revolution on America itself and the abolitionist movement and also the women's suffrage movement, that we're going to go into more specifics, like I said, in terms of uh, in February, you know, African History Month, and uh, also in March in terms of... Uh, a Women's History Month. People should know, and in particular what was mentioned by Maureen in terms of the Barbary Wars. The Barbary Wars had a tremendous influence on American history. The first battles of the United States of America in foreign soil was in fact during the Barbary Wars. For example, the Battle of Darna, which is uh, sometimes referred to as the in the shores of Tripoli. That was the first battle that was the first. That was the first, in fact, uh, victory of the United States forces abroad, and many people do not realize that was also also one of the battles that most of the people who fought there were not Americans. They were, in fact, Greek mercenaries, uh, which are indicated obviously in the history also with with Arab uh, Arab fighters that also joined in the in in the in the fighting. We know of an African-American slave, for example, uh, James Williams, a uh, slave of Baltimore, who fought in the Barbary Wars mm -hmm. and then went into Greece and fought in the Battle of Nafpaktos, uh, and in fact uh, died and is buried in Greece. There were many fighters, obviously, in, in the United States. So one of the things of this particular event has to do with women of Greece and uh, and of course, uh, the United States, you know, both both together. So, Marina, I just wanted to make a couple of a couple of points. Um, I apologize. I should mention one more thing. There would have been a lot more um, fighting uh, with regards to Phil Hellenes within Greece itself. But for those who may not know, uh, after the Napoleonic Wars, after the Napoleonic Wars, it was decided not not to support revolutions anywhere, anywhere in, in Europe. And as a matter of fact, uh, the Phil Hellenes, once the war broke out in Greece, there may have been, there would have been maybe tens of thousands who would have went and fought in Greece in the revolution. But in fact, their own nations did not support the revolution. And in fact, they made sure that all the ports, except one in Europe, was shut down and no one can get into Greece to basically, to basically fight. The United States itself, and uh, in Maureen's uh, book, uh, she didn't discuss it, but that could be a question too. Uh, the people of the, that'll be the first question. The people in the United States, the people of the United States at that partic particular period supported the uh, Hellenic Revolution by far, men and women. But in fact, and, and in fact, the politicians, as was indicated by, by the Congresswoman. But, but the, but the, the uh, American uh, Congress did not, did not recognize the revolution until after the war was finished. In fact, 
the only nation that recognized, the first nation to recognize the Hellenic Revolution had to do with Haiti. And the reason why Haiti recognized the revolution is because they themselves had freed themselves from slavery and they knew exactly what was taking place in Greece. And in fact, they recognized the revolution from, uh, from the beginning. And in fact, they, they sent supplies actually. Again, talking about the history, we don't know what happened to the men who went to fight from Haiti into Greece. They somehow disappeared. Who knows, maybe in the, in, you know, the Barbary nations they, they took over. But America did not support the, uh, the uh, Hellenic Revolution. One of the reasons had to do, so, so everyone understands, is again, the European nations specifically did not want to support the revolution, any revolutionary causes. And in fact, again, this is, my, this is a history that nobody talks about. But in fact, part of the reason why they joined and part of the reason why the battles took place in, in, uh, in Navarino, et cetera, had to do with all the millions of dollars that were actually sent to Greece in terms of the revolution. And in fact, if, they, if, if, it, if the revolution went a certain other way, that in fact, uh, the London Stock Exchange would have had some serious problems in ter terms of lost money. One more point, and, I, and, I, and I'll stop with that. And I'll, I'll go again to Maureen uh, with the question that I asked, but one more point. Part of the reason why, why the, the women of Zolongo are commemorated and the reason why the Suliotes are recognized as precursors to the revolution is the reason why the revolution started. People are wondering like, why did the revolution start at that particular time? Part of the reason why the revolution started at that particular time was because the Sultan had sent his major forces to attack Ali Pasha in Yanina. Ali Pasha was the same person that, uh, that forced the Suryotas to go into Corfu and some of the other areas. And because, because the forces which went in there in, in, uh, in, in 1820, in late 1820, it was recognized by the Filiki Eteria that they had to strike and start the revolution or maybe the Greek uh, people would never be free because the Ottoman forces were, were, were uh, battling with Ali. And as a matter of fact, the major commander or the Pasha of the Moria, the Peloponnesus was sent in particular after, after checking out the area to make sure there would be no revolution. He was sent into, into Yanina to try to defeat uh, Ali, Ali who was, uh, who was embattled, as a matter of fact, invited the Suliotes to come back to actually support him. And in fact, they were fighting Ali into 1822. So with that, I will stop. And uh, Maureen, and I apologize for myself talking too much, Maureen. So your question is, why did the United States not support or not officially recognize Greek independence prior to the end of the war? Yes, you, you wrote about that. So you <laughs> Yeah, so there, there's a number of factors, of course. Um, President Monroe uh, very much wanted to recognize independence, or at the very least send aid. There was much discussion about sending monetary support, perhaps some supplies. Um, but his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, um, harped that, that that was not the right choice for the United States at the time. They were hoping to secure a, uh, a trade uh, alliance with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the belief was that if they recognized Greek independence, the Ottomans would have nothing to do with the United States. Uh, the Ottomans, frankly, didn't really want to have a conversation with uh, the United States anyway. Um, the Russia, uh, for one reason or another, was supportive of the United States um, having a presence um, in the region, and they, of course, did not trust Russia. So uh, there, there's quite a lot of just international relations that have to do with it. Um, but ultimately, Monroe... Um, uh, in his, he issues the Monroe Doctrine, ultimately saying that the United States is going to stay out of European affairs. Um, and of course, it's, it's, it's this famous um, State of the Union address. In that address, however, which people don't maybe read the, <laughs> read the speech very much, but um, he actually does go into his personal support for Greece. He acknowledges public support 
um, that existed at the time, but ultimately uh, the U.S. decides to wait. Um, probably the closest the U.S. comes to directly aiding Greece was, I mentioned it in my, my overview, uh, the Greek frigate scandal. Um, and and it's, it's very convoluted, but uh, there were two ships that were commissioned by um, members of the Greek provisional government. Uh, they came over to the U.S. and uh, wanted these two ships made. Um, well, there was mismanagement in constructing the ships, uh, the cost that, the, that they quoted spiraled out of control, and basically Greece was not going to be able to pay them for the ships. And of course, that generated huge outrage nationwide. Um, there were calls that the government, the U.S. government should just purchase the ships for Greece. But again, the United States doesn't want to show that kind of direct support. So what ended up happening is the U.S. government did purchase one of those ships, but it went into the United States Navy. That, however, allowed for Greece to purchase the other ship, so they at least got the one ship um, out of the deal. But that's the closest that the United States comes to um, showing their hand and supporting Greece. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to pivot to Marina for questions, but I will I will add one point. Um, FDR, Franklin Del Delano Roosevelt, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, because he was a supporter of Greece in many in many different ways, and he was a mem member of a HEPA, uh, quite frankly, from uh, from the time he was governor in 1931 till the time that he died, uh, he always he always stated he always stated that one of his relatives was in, was involved with the ship uh, shipbuilding companies that were in fact involved in those two particular ships. Marina, uh, we're pivoting to you with some questions. Well, I want to ask Dr. Angelovatis. Uh, what is the greatest inspiration that you can give us of the Greek women of the revolution? I know Bubulina, Manto, you mentioned some others, but what inspired you to write Women and the Greek Revolution and really is your inspiration about uh, the Hellenic women? Let me make sure oh, I've done it all. <laughs> well, I had first been involved with the uh, uh, Greek Revolution, uh, not as a student really, but my thesis was that the, for the period just before the revolution. Uh, it was about the British travelers in Greece, um, the first 20 years or just before the revolution, the early 19th century. Um, there were a lot of discussion about various subjects. And I was interested to see how they saw the great people. And I was interested to see that they had not realized actually that there was a fermentation uh, of the people right there. And afterwards, it uh, just happened that I had some uh, manuscript of um, memoirs or reminiscences of um, one of the people, the Cypriot actually, who fought at the time uh, during the siege of the Acropolis of Athens. Um, and he survived because quite a lot of people were massacred at the time. And um, he, he wrote his memoirs, but he, this was never published. And I was given, uh, in the early 80s, I was given the manuscript, which I published and commanded. And I was initiated of that period at the time. And after that, I started reading, but I was interested in women's history anyway. And since I had a lot of material from the travelers, and by that time I was mature enough to know a lot of other things as well, I wrote something about uh, women during the periods of uh, foreign occupations, about women uh, in Turkokratia and Venetokratia. And then it came somehow as a natural continuation to see more 
you know, more closely what actually happened during the, that period, because of course I've read lots of things, but all those things are sprinkled here and there, and you can't really form an actual picture, well, if, a picture of, for a historian, picture uh, accurate enough. And lots of things that have been written about the women of that period were semi-academic. There have been a real feel and interest in women's history early on. It's not something new. It happened with Kaliroi Paran and others uh, very early on. But these were not really well documented. And afterwards, I saw things you know, published, but not well documented well enough. Suddenly, when, you know, about 10 years ago, I started having uh, an interest in sex history of the, the revolution and things like that. But, you know, they just collect. I know it's, there's so much more, more to write and, and to, to cover. Them, they were not in context. They had nothing to do with actual, I mean, life went on, but things changed through the war. Perhaps you don't see the changes right enough at that time, but you see them falling. Well, I, I do encourage you to work on your book so that we can find out more about what's missing. And, and I'll try. I mean, please. Right now everything is closed down. I've been doing some research, but as I told you, it's. And, and perhaps Dr. Hopefully, Kaliampu. Hopefully, I will finish it. Please do. And Dr. Kaliampu, again, are on the wonderful myths, what was most inspirational for our audience on the uh, on the myths of the folk tales of the Greeks? Well, I, I think reality is more important for people. I mean, if they actually realize what things or what really is there, uh, they can reason more accurately rather than fantasizing or rejecting. Because if you can really establish that, you know, women fought, it was not a myth. Uh, women died as men did at the time because of starvation, of wounds, of whatever. It's a reality, it's not a myth of women's schools starting being established by foreigners and by Greeks before that. Women's schools at first. So perhaps that is the legacy of the Philhellenic movement. The Acropolis, Parthenon. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Santelli, you cover that in your book, The Philhellenic uh, yes. Legacy in yes. Greece. But before that, uh, Greeks themselves, four monasteries supplied the money, four monasteries of Athens supplied the money for um, um, schools to be established, both male and female, uh, with uh, using the method, as they called it, uh, like Australian method. And there was the first Greek school established up at the Acropolis called Parthenon, because there were the Parthenons there, the Greek girls, the virgins. Yes, lose a beautiful uh, background of the Parthenon. Today, I feel like we've been in the school <laughs> all together at the Parthenon. 56 girls studying there until the, the, the second siege of Athens started. And of course, uh, all the schools that, which were established in Syria and uh, in Tinos afterwards, uh, there were missionaries and uh, Philanines who established them, but there were Greek committees who collected money from all over the place. Uh, to, and, you know, yes, it's obviously the support for Greece. Uh, so El El Elas is that Greek women pass through the war. Well, and certainly that, the, the contribution of, of Greek women cannot be overlooked. And we, we were certainly going to continue. To the future of women, in, you know, the modern state. Well, the Greek women are certainly part of the legacy. And uh, I hope that uh, through this American Hellenic Revolution bicentennial year, when we talk about history, we'll be 
very uh, clear about the contributions of the heroic women of the revolution, not only the warrior women in our, in our folk tales, but in our history and in America, bringing together the Hellenic and the Philhellenic movement uh, in the discussion of the American Hellenic uh, bicentennial of the, um, the War of 1821. I think that should wrap up our conversation for today. Lou, did you have any closing remarks that you'd like to make? And I wanna thank all of our panelists for participating. Just, just one, uh, Marina, you, you were gonna ask Maria a question. If you can ask her that question, and then I think we'll wrap it up with the two national anthems. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Well, my yeah. question to Maria was uh, focusing on the dialogue between the folklore and the history um, for the diaspora to see how we can include these conversations about the folk tales in our conversations with the diaspora. And what would you inspire us with? Thank you. Beautiful question. Very good question. And I think what fascinates me at least is this dialogue between uh, history and myth, reality and non-reality, and the stories that we were narrated, the stories that we narrate, we sing, we perform, we know them unconsciously. When we learn in a, a conscious self-awareness to contextualize these stories, we will understand better our history, why we are doing what we are doing and where we are from. So now speaking for diaspora, it is very interesting to me in my new project on the uh, book history of Greek Americans, I investigate how these stories are transformed from Greece to the US. And it's interesting to see how um, vivid these stories still remain in schools uh, for children, Greek American children, in books that they are uh, published by Greek Americans, in newspapers, in performances, in parades. So these stories intertwined with myths are our everyday lives in diaspora. And I think it's important to investigate those stories and to try to understand how, where these two myths and realities go together and where can we uh, differentiate them or not. Me as being an ethnologist, I love stories, I love myths, I love um, imagination. So, but I contextualize those stories and I try to understand what they symbolically mean for the people. So we have definitely to learn a lot uh, about these stories, both for Greeks in Greece as well for Greeks in the US, Greeks in the diaspora. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Santelli, did you want to give us some closing words on the inspiration uh, for you and the Philhellenic movement here in America? Um, so I, I came to the topic um, initially uh, from my master's studies. I looked at the influence of um, the Roman Republic on the first federal Congress. And then I just became interested in trying to trace at what point in time do we see the, we start to see a transition towards an interest in um, Greek democracy. Um, and it, it seemed like it came out around in the 1820s. We start to see this transition towards a more uh, of a, a democratic focus and participation in government. Uh, this is when we see um, universal white male suffrage, for example, being passed in many of the states. And so I was just curious, you know, what was, you know, how do we see that transition then in this interest from the Roman Republic to Greece? And that's, it brought me ultimately to um, the Greek Revolution and uh, this uh, widespread interest in the revolution, specifically because Americans felt that, you know, they're, they are creating a new history for themselves. They are no longer English. And so they identified their history really as being linked with the ancient world. And um, increasingly, they emphasized um, that connection with ancient Greece. And they felt that they, among all nations of the world, that they needed to support um, the, the Greek revolution. Of course, my, my book goes more into some of the racial elements um, that come out with the abolitionist movement where they start to say, you know, if you support the Greeks, why don't we get rid of slavery here and within our own borders? Like what, what's, what's this all about? And so then the race of course comes into the conversation where um, you know, Southerners could justify supporting the Greek revolution from the perspective that well, 
the Greeks are white and we're opposed to white enslavement, but the enslavement of African Americans is is somehow different. Um, so that the, the Philhellenic uh, conversation then really plays in this interesting um, uh, part of uh, the abolitionist movement and then later um, women's rights as well. Thank you, Dr. Santelli. We're going to have more events on these topics and uh, I just wanna thank you and all the other panelists for participating today. And uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation and reading your books, uh, The Greek Fire, Women in the Greek Revolution, and uh, the wonderful book on the Greek folk tales from the Rutledge Modern Reader of Dr. Kalyambu so we can learn more. Thank you all very much for participating. Thank, thank you, thank you everyone. And as we indicated, we will have an event uh, in January. I'm sorry. We will have an event in January regarding the orphans of the revolution. We will have an event in February where we will go into more depth on the uh, on the abolitionist movement and the effects of the Greek revolution on that. And then in March, we will have an event uh, relating to the women's uh, suffrage movement and Greece's influence on that. We're also gonna have an event, by the way, on the, Maria on the clefts, uh, the Armatoli, and, mm -hmm. the, uh, and so we are, we are gonna go into that. Uh, Anastasia, thank you for staying with us. Uh, thank can you. you. Can you bless us with, uh, with two, with two uh, anthems so we can end this oh. fantastic event, one of many uh, going Thank forward. You. If okay. you can start yes. with the uh, the Greek national anthem and end with the American national anthem. Thank you. Thank oh. you. Okay, I, I I would just like to add that uh, uh, regardless the the national anthem of Greece, it it is mentioned in the anthem in the other part of the poem, the American uh, help, the help the Americans gave to Greece. And it's uh, also written in the poem, but we sing only a part of the poem in the national anthem. So you want me to start with the Greek? Yes, yes, thank you. How are you going to sing with me? Uh, at, uh, you will try. <laughs> All together, okay. No, it says... No, it's a little bit to you. I love you. Σε γνωρίζω από την όψη που με βγιά μετράει τη γη Απ' τα κόκαλα βγαλμένη των Ελλήνων τα ιερά Και σαν πρώτα ανδριωμένη χέρο χέρε λευτεριά Και σαν πρώτα Andriomeni, chero chere lefteria, che sambrota, Andriomeni, chero chere lefteria. It's an acapella version from from, it's, it's, it's from home. It's, it's I hope it sounds yeah. well. I don't know. It, it sounds fantastic. Never done it before that way. So it's uh, something really new for me too. The American anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleam whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight all the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, said as that star spangled banner, yeah, we Of the land of the free and the home of the brave. 
Fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Marina. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you. Thank and thank you. you to the audience. Uh, please join us for our other events that will be coming up in, uh, in uh, January. To everyone, uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, uh, happy Hanukkah, happy Kwanzaa. Uh, and to, uh, to everyone, including you in Athens, uh, three of our participants are in Athens right now who are totally locked down. <laughs> uh, not able to leave their houses except if they text the government. Uh, we are we are heading towards better days this coming year. Thank you again. Thank you all. Take Thank care. You. Bye bye.